Hello, sportsmen. Hey, if you tuned in to find out what the outdoor weather report is for outdoor conditions, we got the same story. So I'll tell you what happens at the end of the show. It snowed, it thawed, it snowed, it thawed, it froze, it thawed. Well, we, we still trudge ahead here on Practical Sportsman. We have lots of features to bring you about our Freedom of Information request to the DNR. We have a recipe, a trophy story. We take you fishing to Lake Leelanau and a lot more. Stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost and you're watching The Practical Sportsman. Most people, if they saw this deer, would say it's an albino, but it's not. An animal that is an albino is white because it has no pigment in its skin at all. White hair, white skin, white nose, pink eyes. Now this one has black on its tail, black on its ears. Its nose is black, and instead of pink eyes, it has the normal dark eyes of a deer. Philip Perot from Misik got this video in January of 1996. He said the white buck had just lost its antlers. It had carried a seven-point rack through the breeding season. Now this buck is quite aggressive and acted normally in every other way. Now here's a, another deer that acted normally, stomping like does tend to do, but this doe certainly didn't look normal. To say it had a large tumor on its right rear leg is an understatement. It was a huge tumor of some sort. Unfortunately, we don't have any clues as to what this was, what caused it, or what happened to the deer. This tape was dubbed over some time ago, and we never got any follow-up information from the person who took the video. If the people who sent us this tape would get in touch with us for an update, we'd appreciate it. But from what we can tell, this doe got around all right. She didn't appear undernourished or sick. And as far as what the tumor was, well, we got an additional clue when Rob and Corey Merriman sent us this video. Weird, huh? The same kind of tumor, a big sack. This one was between the front legs of a button buck. You can see when the video was taken, October, 5 a.m., one of these backyard feeding station deals. Rob and Corey told us they saw the buck one more time, but the sack was empty and the skin was hanging loose. Very weird. And for odd deer, we'll go back to the subject of albinos, give you a test. Is this an albino? The answer is no. This deer has pigment. Black eyes, dark face, dark hooves. This is just called a white deer. It was videotaped by Ed Willauer of Madison Heights. You might wonder if white deer have fawns that are white. Well, sometimes, but not always. This white doe was with a fawn. And judging by the fawn's behavior, it belongs to the white doe. Walks right between mama's legs. Well, if natural coloration is so important in the wild, the way hunters think it is, why doesn't this white deer scare the other deer away? Eh, nature is weird, isn't it? John, yep, not only videos, but the museum. Yep, we also have a, it's a hunting license here from 19... It's really in quite fragile shape here, but it's from 1930, and it's a hunting license. Uh, Daryl Dunsmore sent this from Fowlerville in memory of Levi Duns, Dunsmore. That, so these used to be buttons that you used to get. Mm -hmm. And at quite a discounted price from nowadays, by the way. Oh, yeah. How as much I understand Yes, it. I, probably. I don't know. We'll have to get into that on one of these shows, the, the price of the new license fee increase. Mm -hmm. But we'll save that for another time. But there's other uses for licenses. For licenses? Yes. Kevin Hugel is his name. He's from Saginaw. Uh, he has a little business he called Kevin's Mycotech, uh, which is, I guess, making embedments, he calls them. Mm -hmm. And this is what he did with his license, a couple broadheads and a a medallion from the North American Hunting Club. But he, he also has done this with some other things, with some mushrooms. Here's some morel mushrooms. But he thought this would be a good idea to have in the museum. And, of course, if you want to stop by and look at these, of course, he'll mm -hmm. embed whatever you wish. Mm -hmm. You see, John, you could use your deer licenses, <laughs> and I could use mine, too, because these aren't used. Yes, I do have one or two that haven't. <laughs> you can come to the museum and see that, as a matter of fact. In fact, we have exhibits from all over the world. We have a, a viewer sent this to us from... He was uh, vacationing down the Grand Caymans, and it turns out we're on television in the Grand Cayman Islands. Jack Hart from Gawadden. Yep. Jack Hart. Sent that, and and th there we are on a TV network down there. And they Amazing. don't send us a dime, do they? <laughs> Not that I know but of. But it's kind of fun to be international. And speaking of international, uh, a guy named Maurice Past from Val d'Or, Quebec, Canada, from Quebec. He makes these, these are actual birch bark, I guess, uh, well, not trinkets, but sort of. I mean, you see these in, 
in tourism stores mm -hmm. and things, but he, he makes these up there out of birch bark. This is a birch bark canoe. You'd want to keep it away from an open flame. <laughs> yeah, well, these things would burn. These would be, but, but no, we appreciate this, Maurice. And we're going to put these in the museum, see if people are interested in them. Yep. Kind of a, a neat type of memento to have. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me of my often condition of being up a creek without a paddle. <laughs> no paddle, just a canoe. That's right. But we have lots of things like this at the museum. People are sending to us, and we're going to keep you acquainted with these. Now, coming up. We're not going to do ice fishing. No ice fishing. We're going to take a little bit of a break from ice fishing. We, uh, oh geez, last, um, you know August? what? It was, in, it was in October when I should have been bow hunting. We were out videotaping a walleye story at night using little inline planers. Very cool. Can you see where you're going? This may look like any evening in July, but it's actually October 10th. The temperature that night dipped down to 28 degrees. John Ford got a call from Mike Steffes, who said the salmon were hitting off Frankfurt, but the wind was howling during the day, so they decided to fish Lake Leelanau for walleye at night. A few anglers sat on shore by their gas lanterns while John and Mike worked the offshore drop-offs, using flashlights to make sure they stayed out of the weed beds. Now, the technique they were using for walleye was to troll body baits, medium-sized rappellas from planer boards set out to the sides. Now you can barely see the planer board in the middle of the frame, which was a problem. These planer boards weren't the big ones that are used in the Great Lakes for salmon and brown trout. These are small planer boards designed for light tackle. You know it's cold when fishermen wear wool mittens while they fish. Well, what I got here, uh, John, is a little inline planer. And uh, what we found out is you get out here at night and they're pretty hard to see. So what we got going here is we tried just about everything. We tried to put reflective tape on it. We tried to put glow tape on it. It's just too hard to see these things with a flashlight, so we come up with something pretty simple and easy. What we've done is we simply bought one of these Calumite sticks, and this stick is a little glow stick is what it is. So what we did is we took the board, and you need a solid board for this. Some of the, some of the manufacturers make them hollow. You need a solid board for this, and what we do is just simply find, we buy the sticks, you can buy them in packs of two, simply take your stick size, find a drill that's about the right size, and drill a hole in the top of the board. So what we're going to do is we're just simply going to break the stick, that activates it. it's going to activate the stick, and we're just simply going to take it and shove it down in the hole. And what that does is it simply gives us a reference for the board when we're out fishing. We can see this thing, whether it's 25 feet out or 60, 70, or 100 feet at times. It just depends. And again, you can do it with a big one or a small one. Yep, I think we got one right here. There we go. That'll work. First fish, guys. Yeah. We avoid the skunk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Nice little wall dive. Yep. Let's get him. I can bring him around to the side. Here. Okay. October 10th, cold front, 28 degrees. The fish wait till they're in the boat before they start to fight. Well, good deal, Mike. All right. Woo -hoo -hoo. Just about legal. No, I don't know. I don't know. Anybody got tape measure? <laughs> well, John Ford has turned into a diehard hunter and fisherman. I mean, you have to be diehard to fish all night. Just as the wind put the Great Lakes fishing down, the cold front cooled down the walleye fishing as well. But this one was a keeper. 17 inches. That'll work. That's a keeper. Yep, cool. All right, great. Good deal, yeah. man. Great, that works. Skunk is off. All right. Now we can relax and <sighs> have a little fun. Enjoy ourselves yeah. a little bit. Yes, we can. Let's put her in the box. All right. Well, the box is an ice chest, which doubles as a boat seat. Well, now you can see the glow stick on the little inline planer. Actually, it's more difficult to pick this up with the camera at night than it is to see it with your naked eye if you were there. At night, the pupils of your eyes will open up. After a while, you can see fairly well, so the glow sticks stand out much better than what you're seeing here. What's a board going to do when a fish hits? One of two things. With the walleye, the board is either just simply going to start moving backwards, just like the walleye simply grabs on, or again, it's going to move backward. The fish will hit it fast enough so that it pulls the release and simply flips the board down, and the board will go to the fish. Okay, well, I'm, Mike, I'm going to turn off the light. Yep. If you can just hold it up there cause so yep. we can see what it looks yep. like. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, you can see that no problem. Mm -hmm. 
It works real well. And so, then you'll have them, and basically you set these up. I'll turn on the light again. Okay. You turn, you set them up so that they're in a line. Yeah, what we do is stagger them out so they run in a 45 from the inside course, course to the outside. And what it does, again, is it spreads the boards out. It gives you something visual to look at, a sight line to look down so you can see when that board or whichever one the fish happens to take disappears. It definitely helps. If it drops down, you know yeah, there's a fish. Yeah, it drops down or floats back out of line. You know you got either weed or you hooked up on bottom or you got a fish on. This one's got the bite to it, whatever it is. Well, we were marking fish all through here for about the last 10 minutes. Finally, we got something going. Yeah, I can see my oh, yeah. surface. Yep, it's a walleye, I can believe it too. Well, the cold weather slows the fish down, but you notice it kind of slows the anglers down too. A little bit. Feel like yeah, a good one? Is. Yeah, it doesn't feel too bad at all. You got a little bit of fight from the board, you know, but that's one of the things you have to do in order to increase right. your fish catch yep. a little bit. You got to <laughs> give up a little bit to try to, to gain a little bit of an advantage. You want them to bring them on this side? Right yeah, or? we'll bring them right up here to the corner. Is this rod in your way at all? Uh, yeah, why don't you move it up to the next rod holder, John. Just move it up and stand it up there. There you go. Oh, yeah, another keeper, boys. You gotta believe it. Yep, Isn't I like believe fish? it is. Oh, yeah. That is if you don't lose it. <laughs> Lean back a little bit. Yeah, good man. Right at me, Mike. Yeah. Well done. Woo, there we go, huh? Yes, that works. I'm impressed with these little boards. Don't they work good? Especially <laughs> with, well, with the lights on. That's the first thing I've seen was the light headed straight yep. backwards, you know? Yep. Just like... A little glow stick, stick all of a sudden just shoots. Boy, he was hooked yeah. up. He wasn't going anywhere. Cold fingers on a cold fish. Well, we'll change that with a hot frying yep. pan. These little mini otters, inline planer boards manufactured by Big John, don't come with glow sticks, but you don't really need them if the moon is out and you can see the boards by moonlight. Well, as the cold front settled over Lake Leelanau, John Ford brought a small walleye to the net. Well, it was too small, as a matter of fact. So in the wee hours of what was now October 11th, John Ford, Mike Steffes, and Matt Radzalowski convened to gloat over their bounty. But remember, it isn't how many fish you catch that makes a trip successful. That just determines how many you'll have to eat. Well, we're not going to go hungry, huh? No, we ain't going to go hungry. I don't think we're going to feed a famished uh, <laughs> land, but... Uh, well, it's kind of pitiful, Matt. <laughs> something's better than nothing. <laughs> but what can you say? The inline planers work, and it was fun testing them out. So, Hey, hey thanks a lot, Anytime, man. Anytime, you guys. It was a yep. great time. Enjoyed yeah. myself. People have been wondering why we're digging into this DNR regulation that says your second archery tag is a buck tag in certain parts of the state and is a doe tag in other parts of the state. Well, the reason we're digging into this and going through the Freedom of Information Act is because we get a lot of questions about the laws and sportsmen wave this to us and they say, but it says right here that the law right here, well, actually, according to the statutes in the state, what the DNR puts out in this, this hunting and trapping guide, this isn't the law. This is regarded as an informational bulletin, some information about the laws. But the words in here aren't really the exact laws. So they're subject to misinterpretation by the public. And if you misinterpret the law, you can get a ticket on that, and you go to court, and you say, but judge, says so in here. Doesn't matter. This isn't the law. So th this is where we're going with this. We're trying to explain to the public where the laws come from, how they end up in here, and what happens when they're wrong. So what we've done on this particular regulation, Sal Ghani and I have conspired, so to speak. Not really. That's, no. that's not the word. We have gotten together to trace this down through the DNR to find out where this particular regulation came from. That, that, see, the problem with this, Sal, is that if, if a person has a deer, a, a doe, with a tag on it that is normally the buck tag and he drives downstate, he could get a ticket for having an improperly tagged deer. 
He could have not taken the property, you're correct, Fred. Uh, and the problem here, the purpose here is trying to get an understanding of what the law com where the law comes from. Um, we did send a, a Freedom Information Act request out, and Ms. Benson from the DNR was very kind of send us uh, these probably 100 pages or so here. Right. And it's very confusing. And like you said in this book here, the law is just summarized in here, and the goal is to inform people where laws come from and how they're made. And I think that we're going to get to the bottom of it and be able to explain exactly why and how a law comes about. But we're not going to be able to explain this quickly. No. Because... It is complicated, and thanks to, got to give a little plug here, to Dean LeDuc, who is the professor in my administrative law class in law school right now, and he is the authority in the state on administrative law, and he has cautioned the class that this is difficult stuff. The agencies don't always understand how the statutes should be interpreted, the courts don't always understand it, and the public we're kind of floundering. So it takes some methodical investigation here. And what we found, the DNR sent us, here's a summary, most of the weight of the packet is letters from the public. Now actually only two of these letters were from 1995. The rest of them were from 1994 so they don't really pertain. We have two uh, documents here that are email I guess, email between some DNR biologists about the regulations. We have the Wildlife Conservation Act order, which it has in here this one section that we were discussing. And then it has some memos amongst the DNR people, uh, just a couple pages. This is basically all we got, Sal. We've got some more to get yet, I think. We, we do, because according to the statute that they sent us, and the statutes we're working off from, uh, there's a procedure they have to go through, the DNR has to go through, in order to implement a law which makes a, a, a tag, a doe tag in one area and a buck tag in another. We also got, and this is very interesting, uh, we got a bill. Now, this Freedom of Information Act, um, you have the freedom to get the information, but the information is not free. You have to pay for it. And looking here at the bill, we have... Uh, Document copies, 114 pages at five cents a piece. The mailing was three dollars, and here it says the labor, two hours at seventeen dollars and seven cents an hour. So who is it down at the DNR, or at any state agency, who copies this stuff? It's supposed to be, according to the Freedom of Information Act, the what? Well, Fred, the statute says whenever you um, request a copy, they can charge you for the copies. And here, quite frankly, it's a bargain. Five cents a copy is cheap, mm -hmm. uh, but they charge labor at seventeen dollars an hour. The statute says that you can charge um, the lowest paid clerical person uh, salary in the office. So if they take five or six hours, you'd have to take the person that uh, earns the least in the office or charge the least amount that they make. So this means that the least paid person down at the DNR makes $17.07 an hour? You know, every time I tell this to somebody, they say, ooh, can I work there? I mean, that's a chunk of change. I mean, this is a, a relatively highly paid employee making copies. There's more questions we have. I guess that's, we are just beginning this investigation, but we will be able to tell you sooner or later how these DNR regulations, a stack of them, a stack of these laws which get passed, they're not going through the legislature anymore, folks, and Proposal G has changed this as well. How do they get to be laws that you and I have to abide by? We'll answer that in another edition of Sportsman and the Law. Last Saturday, the 1997 Big John Fishing Awards Banquet was packed to the gills, so to speak, at the Eagles Hall in Lansing. Tickets sold out 10 days in advance, but everybody filled up on the buffet catered by Coils of Houghton Lake. Lots of trophy stories were recorded for the coming year. Last year, Bob Duger from Saginaw told us the story about his big eight-point buck that he thought he'd never get on state land. I hunt state land, and uh, there are deer like this on state land. You don't have to go to private to get it. Um, I hunt the swamps. Um, on opening morning, I had a guy at about 10 minutes to 7 come walking right up on my bait pile uh, with his flashlight, searched around looking for me, and uh, didn't spot me, and uh, I was certain that he was going to hunt my area. So uh, I waited till uh, daylight, and I walked up to my bait pile and I kind of just talked out into the swamp saying, you know, that this was, you know, my bait pile and that I was hunting it. And uh, I just got back to my blind, got settled in, was kind of disappointed over the, the interruption. You know, interruption and whatnot. And about 20 minutes later, he walked in and, uh, you know, it was uh, 
pretty uh, pretty simple. One shot, he run 30 yards the wrong way, and uh, and then I was able to get him. Bob Duger from Saginaw not only got a trophy eight point last year, but he even got a bigger one, a ten point the year before. State land, nonetheless, for that will make Bob Duger from Saginaw our Deer Quest Trophy Hunter of the Week. Here's a venison recipe with an oriental twist. Venison and shrimp fried rice submitted by Mary Fuller from St. Charles. It calls for one pound of cubed venison steak, which you marinate in soy sauce for an hour. In a wok, scramble five eggs, set them aside, then stir fry the marinated venison cubes in a little oil, set them aside. Then you stir fry a cup of chopped celery, adding in a half cup of chopped onion. Then stir in a small bag of those little frozen ready-to-eat shrimp, add a medium can of bean sprouts, then stir in the meat and the eggs that you've already cooked. The last step is folding in two cups of hot cooked rice with a little soy sauce. Not too much, though. That's venison and shrimp fried rice. Easy to make, easy to eat. Uh, we will be out doing some fishing and bringing you brand new shows week after week, so stay tuned. Get outdoors if you can this weekend. Heck, it's a great place to be, even if it is a little warm and sloppy. See you next week. This deer has pigment. Black eyes, dark face, dark hooves. This is just called a white deer. It was videotaped by Ed Willauer of Madison Heights. You might wonder if white deer have fawns that are white. Well, sometimes, but not always. This white doe was with a fawn, and judging by the fawn's behavior, it belongs to the white doe. Walks right between mama's legs. Well, if natural coloration is so important in the wild, the way hunters think it is, why doesn't this white deer scare the other deer away? Eh, nature is weird, isn't it?